I think we have somebody very famous here. I, th I think we see her often in the paper. In fact, the articles keep getting longer, and I keep spending more time reading them. Lori Dengler, of course, is uh, Emeritus Profe Professor of Geology at HSU, is an expert on earthquake and tsunami hazards and hazard mitigation. She got her bachelor's, master's, and PhD in geophysics from the University of California at Berkeley and taught at the HSU Geology Department from Oh, it says 2978. Mm, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> I think I made a typo. 1978 to 2015. She was a member of the team that developed the U.S. National Tsunami Hazards Program and has participated in six international post-tsunami survey teams. She was recognized as an HSU Scholar of the Year in 2008, received California's Alquist Medal for Earthquake Mitigation Efforts in 2009, and was recognized by the Frank Press Award from the Seismological Society of America for Public Service in 2017. And she's still at it. In 2015, she published a children's book about a tsunami debris boat that connected cities in Japan and California. Since retiring from teaching, she writes a weekly, re weekly column in the Eureka Times Standard and has developed a K-12 curriculum based on the tsunami boat project. Here's Lori. And she has some backup here in the form of Amy Uwiki, who wrote a book on this project. And there are going to be some slides about that, too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me back. I think it was two and a half, three years ago that I gave a talk before. And there'll be some things that will be similar, and there'll be hopefully a lot of things that are different. And today I'm going to really focus on an incredible, truly extraordinary story. And uh, you're now all in the boat with me. I always like to start my talks with the most important take-home message, and then you're all allowed to fall asleep. <laughs> so what I have learned over and over with these various post-earthquake tsunami um, reconnaissance trips is there's nothing important than a, more important than education and knowing what to do and responding quickly. And in the case of earthquakes and tsunamis, the most important thing is first to basically do nothing, which is easy. The ground starts to shake. You are not to run out the door. Don't scream. Don't head to the doorway. If you are able, get down under the table. But that's not critical. The most important thing is to basically not move. If you can stay in one spot, lean over, try to get your head below the level of the table. But if you can't do that, just basically, you know, sit where you are and stay put. For the simple reason, and we have science to back it up, is the further you move while the ground is shaking, the more likely you are to be injured. It's that simple. And once you've moved more than about five feet, you know, five feet, uh, you know, I might still be able to scramble over there under the edge of the table. The table will give me a little more protection from things falling down. But don't move. And when people tell me, I felt so stupid in the earthquake, I just froze in one spot. And I said, congratulations, you did really well. It's my friends who say, I found myself across the street and down the road before I had even had a chance to think. They're the ones that have the problem because you have to be able to still your instinct and stay put. You also need to be aware of what your hazards are. And if you're in a place, if you happen to be on the beach, feeling an earthquake is the first indication you're going to get that a tsunami may be on its way. Don't wait to hear a siren, because you won't. 
use the earthquake as your alert. And if that earthquake feels long to you, and I don't need to define long, because you'll know what long is. You'll go, oh, now I understand what Lori was talking about. If the earthquake is kind of over before you've even had a chance to think, not a tsunami problem. Because the longer the shaking, the larger the magnitude. The larger the magnitude, the bigger the fault, and the potential for deforming the seafloor. So it's that long earthquake. And if you happen to be outside, your sensitivity to feeling ground motion is actually diminished. If you feel an earthquake outside, that's probably a pretty good size earthquake. Um, but it's long. And, and if it's a tweener, you know, who is that long or not? When in doubt, drill it out. Consider it something to just practice your evacuation skills. So know how to get from an area of hazard or risk to a safe place. And the good news for all of you is that the last week of March is Tsunami Week in California. And Humboldt County will be unveiling new tsunami hazard maps. The other really good thing about the new maps is that in no place in Humboldt County has the hazard gotten worse than what we've been working with. In fact, in many places, it looks like we've been overly conservative. So we won't need to go quite as far inland in the Eel River Valley. Basically, what, what we've been doing already will work fine, uh, but you'll be hearing more about those new maps at the end, uh, end of March. Once you have evacuated, you need to stay there. And you need to stay there until basically someone in an official capacity says it's safe to go back. So the tsunami hazard can last hours and hours, and in some cases, days. In 2011, the largest surges in the Santa Barbara area were 23 hours after the first. So tsunamis are tricky. There are other things you should be aware of on the beach, certainly sneaker waves. Always pay attention to the water. If you have a dog that gets swept into the water, what are you going to do? You're going to let that dog get out on their own because the dog is much more capable of getting out than you are. So don't rush after the dog. Keep your children, grandchildren, away from the water's edge. Uh, especially when there's a sneaker wave alert. But we can have strong surges larger than the sort of ambient at any time of year. I'm also going to add a couple of new things to my important take-home message. Wash, wash, wash your hands. <laughs> if you can't wash, wash, wash your hands, have your sanitizer. No hugs. No handshakes. Uh, get into the Japanese habit. That's very polite, and it maintains your space. And this is not a joke. Just like earthquakes, it's not if but when COVID-19 will arrive here. Be prepared. Just like for earthquakes, if you've been preparing for earthquakes, you're already there. To be able to shelter in your house for at least two weeks, preferably a month, because that's what we may all be doing. Fortunately, I have a lot of crossword puzzles. <laughs> OK, so now for the amazing story of Camo May. And that type of mask will not help you for COVID-19. But it was very important when I was doing post-earthquake reconnaissance in Japan because the winds were blowing all the debris and the dust was just terrible. So there is a use for those masks. So this is a story 
that to me really boils down is that sometimes people are good and do the right thing. And Camel May is just such a story. Now, I'm going to tell it from my perspective, but it is a story that has involved an army of people. And this doesn't even begin to include all of the folks who've been involved. Uh, I do want to point out Amy Wacky, uh, without whom this would never have happened. And I want to point out Kumi. Where's Kumi? Ah, Kumi Watanabe Shock, who without her work, this whole story might not have ever happened because she was the one who was able to very quickly link where this little tsunami debris boat had come from, and then I was able to jump on that. So she's really perhaps the number one domino. Without our number one domino, this would not have happened. I'm actually going to start this story about six weeks before the earthquake, because I was in Japan. I was at a meeting um, on coastal disaster preparedness. I was the US representative. There were 14 countries there. And um, I gave a talk on California tsunami preparedness. But while I was there, one of the talks was given by the mayor of Kasenema. I had never heard of Kasenema before. It's going to enter into this story in just a minute or two. And the mayor of Kasenema was very proud of all they had done to prepare their city for tsunamis. They had lots of vertical evacuation. And people were trained to vertically evacuate. And he announced that every country in the world really needed to follow the example of Kasenema because Kasenema knew how to do it correctly. This is Kasenema at about 5 p.m. on March 11th, a Friday afternoon of 2011, one of the more famous photographs of the tsunami. And these are photos of Kasenema taken shortly after the tsunami. Needless to say, the plans in this case didn't work. One of the things we learned was reliance on vertical evacuation is not very good when you can't vertically evacuate high enough. And one of the problems in Japan was this sort of reliance on artificial structures when they had high ground only minutes away. So sometimes hubris gets you into trouble, most of the time. Now, that same day, the tsunami didn't just affect Honshu, Japan. It affected much of the Pacific, and in particular, affected uh, the north coast of California. Uh, Crescent City had more damage than any place outside of Japan. And the only death outside of Japan <coughs> occurred at the mouth of the Klamath River. Now, I'm part of a community that tries to figure out as much as we can when a major tsunami happens. And so as soon as this earthquake and tsunami occurred, uh, the 40, 50 of us in the sort of international tsunami community started communicating with one another and saying, OK, who can be pulled together to um, staff teams to go and try to understand the water heights, um, how people behaved, what were the factors that exacerbated or reduced impacts. Um, and so I communicated with uh, a colleague of mine, Megumi Sugimoto, uh, who's now a professor at Kyushu, 
Um, she was a postdoc at the time. And so we said, OK, the two of us are going to do uh, a survey to really look at those factors that the, the human factors that exacerbated impacts. In 10 days, we were all over the place. We rented this little white uh, Mazda, Matsuda, as you'd say in Japan. And the one thing we had to sign on is that we wouldn't take it to the beach. <laughs> well, the beach sort of came to us, OK? So it didn't really count. And when we turned it back in, we were really hoping that no one would look underneath it. I think five hours after we had rented it, we got it stuck in the sand. Fortunately, it was very little, and the two of us were able to kind of lift it out. Um, so there is Kasenema, uh six weeks after the tsunami, and clearly it had not been completely cliened up. Minami Sanriku, uh, one of the saddest places. This was the uh, disaster prevention center. It was where all of the police and the personnel in the city involved with managing a disaster went. Unfortunately, most of them died. There were uh, some people who managed to survive who got onto the very top. Uh, Ishinomaki, where there were more deaths than anywhere else, because it was a bigger city. And the very last afternoon of the last field day, Meg said to me, what do you think about going a little further north into Iwati Prefecture and visiting Rikus and Takeda? And I thought, oh, OK, sure, fine. At this point, you know, it was things were just kind of running into one another. And uh, this is one of the overview photos I took of the seawalls and the damage. And then I learned later that there's a famous pine tree. And the pine tree was actually still alive when I took this photo. Um, and not only that, there's a building here with a blue roof that I would learn much later was Takata High School. I probably took 1,300 photographs during that reconnaissance trip. Fortunately, I never throw anything away. I never throw away an email. Well, there are some, I do. <laughs> but um, I, it's my archival system. And three years later, I managed to find that. Why is that important? Well. It turns out that I'm going to have a relationship with Rikus and Takada. While I was there, I learned that Rikus and Takada has a Facebook page. And I thought, OK, I'm going to start following Rikus and Takada on Facebook just to sort of get a sense of how the recovery is going. I didn't go there very often, but every now and then I would take a look and see what was happening. And it turned out to be fortunate, because maybe that was the first domino. I, I, it's hard to tell who was really the first domino in this. Two years later, April 7, 2013, there's a report to the Del Norte Sheriff's Office that something odd has shown up on Crescent Beach. So we can see this little boat that is just absolutely covered with barnacles. Now, I know a lot of people in Del Norte County. And that morning, Cindy Henderson, who was the emergency manager at the time, called and said, Lori and Troy, you have to get up here. And we did. And at that point, the boat was in uh, the sheriff's um, holding area. And we spent much of that day pouring over it. And you can see there is, I mean, it's, 
And, and all the barnacles are growing on the top side. There's actually none on the bottom. This is going to become part of the story, too. This little rope was attached on the back, and it was where the boat had been tied at the time because it was not in use and nobody died in this boat. That's important to understand. It was tied, and the force of the tsunami snapped this rope. So this rope is the last connection that Kamome had with Japan. When we scraped away some of the biomass, we found these kanji, these Japanese characters, taka, ta, ko, ko, which I didn't have a clue. Well, I knew ta. Ta means field. That's the character. Now all of you know a Japanese character. <laughs> um, but I really didn't know what it meant. But I did know who could help me. So I took my photos, and here is the registration for the boat, and I sent them to Kumi, and I think it took you maybe a half an hour to say, yeah, that's Takata High School, and it's in Iwate Prefecture, and it's in the city of Rikuzen, Takata. Now there's a whole protocol at this point about how you connect tsunami debris with Japan. And, and we did that. We filed it with the Weather Service, and they sent the files in. That was Monday. On Wednesday, I'm going, it's taking too long. It's taking too long. And I remembered, aha, I'm a Facebook friend of Rikuzen Takada. Again. I, screenshots, never throw anything away. Here's my post. A possible tsunami boat was found. And here is, so we have maybe, I'm Domino 1, she's Domino 2. Domino 3 is Amia Miller, who is the person that is monitoring the foreign posts to Rikuz and Takata's Facebook page. Amazing story, a woman that was born in Japan, spent the first 18 years of her life in Japan, um, then had a business in Boston. After the earthquake and tsunami, she got on a plane, did a lot of volunteer work, and six, by this point, um, two years later, uh, she is, um, basically doing all of the, the connections between Rikuzen Takada and the non-Japanese world. So she saw my post. She instantly recognized that this was significant. Had it been almost anyone else, they might have said, yeah, it's our boat. That's interesting. End of story. It wasn't the end of the story. Because yet another group comes in to play their role. The boat's just sitting there. Nobody knows quite what to do with it. And a group of students at Del Norte High School decide, OK, let's try to send this boat back to the people who lost it. And uh, it's a real interesting group of kids. Um, they get out of, I think, a couple of afternoon periods to wash the boat and clean it. Um, and they actually do this really cool sort of formal presentation to the city of Crescent City, uh, where they bring the boat in, and uh, the Tala were, were there. And I mean, it was, it was great. It was a great community experience. Fortunately, Amia had really gotten hooked. And so she's working behind the scenes in Japan to get the boat returned. And she manages to find a lot of organizations, and in particular, one of the largest shipping companies in the world. And so uh, 
In September of 2013, Camomay is placed on a, uh, a truck and starts heading uh, on her journey back to Japan. And arriving in October, and then there was this wonderful ceremony of the students from Takata High School. Um, and it makes all the major newspapers the story in Japan. So this is October 21st. There's no way I'm going to let this story sit. <laughs> so 10 days later, I'm in Japan. And I'm meeting Amiya for the first time. And I get to see Kamome again. A month later, a new US ambassador shows up in Japan, Carolyn Kennedy. And her very first official duty is she visits Rikuzen Takeda, meets Mayor Toba. And she presents Mayor Toba with some shells from Camel May. I don't really quite remember how she got them, but she did. <laughs> All right, this is all happening pretty fast. So again, Amiya is working behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, manages to get funding from the Tomodachi Foundation to invite six Del Norte High School students to Japan. And they're, they are a cross-section of Del Norte High School. We're not looking at the AP students. We're looking, I think there was a sophomore, there were a couple of seniors. I mean, it was a really diverse group. And we weren't really sure how this, I mean, most of them had barely been out of California. Uh, it was certainly, uh, they had never traveled to Japan before. And so here they are, reunited with Camel May. And one of the, this really sort of sets the style for all the subsequent exchanges, which is, you know, it's, it's really getting to know one another. And, and the amazing thing is that these kids with their cell phones can communicate just fine. They don't need a translator. They're just, boo, boo, boo. they've got it. So. And here they are in front of the lone pine tree, which at this point is really a faux pine tree because there was so much salinity in the soil, the tree had died. And they basically reconstructed it. They put a metal core in it. They saved all the branches. So it looks exactly the same as my photo of the pine tree. It's still a symbol of resilience, but it's a faux tree now. And the final stop on their trip, they got to meet Carolyn Kennedy. And for those of us of our generation, I mean, boy, that's as close to royalty as you can get, right? So, uh, and they presented the rope. Aww. Notice it did get cleaned. <laughs> so the last piece of chamomile to touch Japan now lives in the US Embassy in Tokyo. And I consider that means I have a half a degree of separation from Carolyn Kennedy. <laughs> Again, the story continues. It doesn't end. Um, it was uh, a featured display in January 2015 at the Tokyo National Museum. That's like the Smithsonian. And there you can see Camel May. Um, and then a year after the first visit of the Del Norte students to Japan, we have the first visit of the Takata High School students to Crescent City. And just like the group of Crescent City students, these are a real cross-section of kids. And Rikuzen Takeda 
most of the, I mean, it's an economically depressed area. It shares many similarities with Del Norte County. Resource-based, um, some tourism, uh, but most of the kids here stay and they end up, they don't go to college, they end up getting jobs having to do with the harbor. In fact, the reason they had a boat at the high school was not because they had a fancy marine sciences program, it's because they learned how to scuba dive to be able to work in the harbors and work under boats. So, you know, we talked to people, oh yeah, we, we knew when Camo May was out there, we had to give them a wide berth because there were kids learning how to scuba. Uh, so Amia told me one of the boys in this group, I don't know which one, had gotten the worst English score of his class. And when he came here, he worked the hardest. He'd be up all night trying to learn his English. Um, wonderful group. And they got to see the big trees, of course. Now, November 2015, you know, after a couple of hours of work, <laughs> again, and I, it was Kumi that connected me with Amy, and it was Amy who really made this book work. There were actually a number of people who did. It was a year in the birthing, and it was not all smooth. But in November 2015, it becomes the first publication of HSU Press. Because there's yet another domino. I needed somebody to publish it. This is a really odd book. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's um, Japanese English for second graders. And let's just say that's kind of a niche market. <laughs> and so we got rejected from some real, wait, we got really nice words from the folks that rejected us. But just at that time, Cyril Oberlander, who was relatively new as dean of the library, said, oh, well, we'll just start a press. And it was supposed to be primarily electronic, print on demand. And so we walk in, and Amy and I walk in with these books. It's, well, we already have a printed version. Sure, we can do it. We've never done that before. I mean, as I said, people who said yes, when it would have been so easy to say no. I mean, think about that. The next time you immediately say no, so a lot of times, you know, the robocalls say no. But um, sometimes saying yes will take you down interesting paths. And it's really the, the artwork, the illustrations that, that give the heart and soul. And I'm going to actually pass these around. Uh, you can take a look. Uh, these are from an exhibit that Amy had uh, at the Morris Graves a um, couple of years ago that sort of talks about the process that she went through. So you know, I'll just start them. I'm off screen for a minute, sorry. All right, I'm just, I'm back. <laughs> I was told, don't you dare go outside of that area. <laughs> this was really a way of taking the Camomé story even further and providing a window for young children, teachers of young children, parents of young ch children, to hopefully talk about disaster and what can make things better and how being kind really makes a difference and sometimes even when there's something terribly sad that happens or that you're very angry about that good things can happen. 
And hopefully it's also a window to really talk about preparedness, because uh, that's really hard for a lot of people to do. So here we are. Um, actually, the Jacoby <coughs> Creek second graders, um, they actually helped in our review process. It made us real that realize we had to make it really clear that nobody had died in the boat, because that was what <laughs> they were really concerned about. And uh, here we are, Montessori. Here we are, we did this insane road trip. Uh, here we are at the Columbia Maritime Museum. And then in February of 2016, we have a second delegation. I mean, what's really wonderful about this is it's not just a one-time deal. With luck and with other, unfortunately, world conditions uh, have issues, but a second group from Del Norte High went in February of 2016. And again, I mean, there's these I mean, wonderful friendships. And once again, <laughs> visiting the faux tree. <laughs> and on the last day, in March of 2016, Kumi, and Amy, and Reese, and my husband, Tom. We had the most incredible trip to Japan uh, that ended up with my being asked to give the keynote talk at the Tokyo National Museum for the five-year remembrance of the earthquake and tsunami. That's kind of like being asked again to the Smithsonian. And I primarily talked about Kemome. Uh, in Japan, again, it's a bilingual book. 2017, we have the fourth visit. And I just, <laughs> the kids get to be kids. They get to be goofy. What is better than that? And now, you know, the kids have been going back and forth for like four years. Finally, we start getting the grown-ups into it. So the first delegation of Del Norte officials visits Japan. And finally, in 2018, we get the official signing of a sister city agreement between Crescent City and Rikuzen Takeda. There are over 2,000 officially designated sister city relationships. There are at least 600 in the US alone that involve cities in Japan and the US, including Eureka. Eureka has a Japanese sister city. This is the first that was the direct result of a disaster and that was really started by kids because the kids developed the relationship first. International Tsunami Day is November 5th, and in 2018, the two mayors, Mayor Toba of Rikuzen Takeda uh, and the mayor of, Del of Crescent City were invited to the United Nations. Mayor Toba gave a talk. This is like a really big deal in Del Norte County. <laughs> Being invited to the United Nations as an example. Um, needless to say, Crescent City and Del Norte County has really jumped on this in a big way. So January 2019, just a year ago, uh, a group of teachers from Rikuzen Takeda, and here they are actually looking at some of the tsunami education materials in Crescent City. They visited the Tolawa people. And when I saw that, I thought, boy, don't those drums look like Tycho? <laughs> <gasps> Third visit to students. Now, there was supposed to be another student visit of, from Del Norte County that had to be canceled because that was when Korea was doing their nuclear tests. Oh. 
uh, and the missile tests were going right over Rikus and Takada. So that was, that was uh, it was decided not a good time to go to Japan. So uh, at this point, there is another Del Norte visit hopefully planned, but we now have COVID-19 to deal with. So until that situation resolves itself, uh, there won't be any more student exchanges for a while. But we want to keep this story going further and further. And so if you go to Camel May, uh, humboldt.edu slash Camel May, it will take you into our website that has a lot of stuff. I actually update it every single day because I'm crazy. <laughs> um, we now have uh, a bunch of versions. Uh, we have Russian Japanese, German Japanese, Swedish, French, Toloa, and Spanish. Uh, they can be downloaded for free, most of them at this point. They can also be ordered print on demand, some of them. It turns out the Russian, you can't get the Russian or the Toloa. Um, we're still, we may end up doing a Toloa English and a Russian English version. Amy doesn't know about that yet. <laughs> so again, on the resources page, there's a daily earthquake update. That's what I update every single day. And there are a whole bunch of resources. And those of you who don't get the time standard, although I really wish you'd buy it, because having a regional paper is really important. Uh, I know it gets thinner and thinner, and you don't like everything in it, but you like my columns. <laughs> um, you can actually go to the resource page all of my columns are archived there. In addition to podcasts, blog posts, if you're interested in my experience in Japan back in 2011, I've got a whole series of blog posts of what we did every day. Um, reports, videos, etc. And then we put together a curriculum. K through 12. The K through 2 is the most developed at this point. I'm still working on it. Um, and here's an example of some of the K2, K2 activities. We have a coloring book. We have an ABC book. Uh, pasta quake using spaghetti pieces to illustrate earthquake magnitude. Uh, a couple of examples. I love the tsunami heroes and heroines. In the K through 2 version, it features the story of Tilly Smith, who was 10 years old during the 2004 Indonesian tsunami. What she knew about tsunamis, what she had learned in her geography class, enabled her to save 100 people at the resort that she was staying at. She was named, I think, UN Child of the Year and got to meet Bill Clinton. So it's, it's a wonderful story of how what you know can not only save your life, but can save the life, lives of those about you. And her mother didn't believe her. Her mother kind of stayed behind, and finally at the last minute, OK. Um, this is a Japanese folk tale, a lovely video that we got permission to use. And then there's a place for people to give us feedback. OK, now I get to see if I can make this work. OK. The newest project is an animation of the entire book. The Extraordinary Voyage of Kamame, A Tsunami Boat Comes Home.
There is a place called Rikusen Takata in Japan, near the beautiful Pacific Ocean. The people love their high mountains, beaches, and tall pine trees. There is a place called Crescent City in America on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. The people love their beautiful beaches, mountains, and giant redwood trees. Who lives in Rikusen Takata? There are grandparents, mothers, fathers, teenagers, and young children. The grown ups have many different jobs. Some are teachers, police officers, firefighters, and chefs. Some work on boats and fish, and others have jobs that help their city. Families live in Crescent City, too. There are small children, and teenagers, and mothers, and fathers, and grandparents. People work as fishermen, teachers, chefs, police officers, firefighters, and at many other jobs. There is a school in Rikusen Takata called Takata High School. Here, Japanese teenagers know that America is very far away and that the people speak a different language and eat different foods. The students had never heard of Crescent City. There is a school in Crescent City called Del Norte High School. American teenagers there know that Japan is on the other side of the ocean and that the people speak another language and eat different food. They had never heard of Rikusen Takata. And couldn't imagine going to such a faraway place. Takata High School had a little boat to help students learn about the ocean and how to fish. It was named Kamame, the Japanese word for seagull. They painted Takata High School on the side so that everyone would know it was their boat. The characters looked like this. Kamame was tied up on shore with all the other boats when one day a terrible thing happened. There was a very big earthquake. The ground shook and shook and shook. The earthquake caused big waves called a tsunami. The tsunami swept over the city of Rikuzen Takata and washed many buildings, cars, and boats into the ocean. The people were frightened and angry and sad. The tsunami traveled all the way across the Pacific Ocean to America. By the time it reached Crescent City, it was much smaller, but it was still big enough to sweep over the harbor in Crescent City and sink many boats. Kamame and the other boats were washed out into the ocean by the big tsunami waves. Kamame was carried far, far off the coast. The people thought the little boat and all the other things caught in the tsunami were lost forever. The big tsunami waves flipped Kamame upside down. The only part of the little boat above the water was her blue bottom. The winds in the ocean slowly pushed Kamame away from Japan and towards America. Kamame was alone in the big Pacific Ocean. Sometimes Kamame was caught in big storms that tossed the little boat back and forth, up and down. Great waves splashed completely over her, but the little boat was very strong and kept on floating. The little boat's only companions were seabirds, whales, dolphins, fish, and other sea creatures. Sea animals called barnacles stuck to every part of Kamame that was beneath the water. Their long necks floated beneath the little boat. Kamame must have looked very strange to the dolphins and other creatures that swam beneath her. The barnacles grew and grew until they were more than a foot long, dangling beneath the boat like big noodles. Months and months went by. The new year came and went and came again. It was hard for the people in Rikuzen Takata to enjoy New Year celebrations like making mochi. Most of their beautiful town was gone, and they were reminded of the terrible tsunami every day. In America, many people had forgotten about the tsunami and what had happened in Japan. One day, more than two years after the tsunami, 
a strange little boat washed ashore near Crescent City. The Americans had never seen a boat like this before. The long barnacles completely covered the sides. Many people came to look at the boat. They scraped some of the barnacles off the boat and saw the Japanese writing. They wondered what it said. A Japanese person read the characters, which said, Takata High School. The people in Crescent City learned that Takata High School was in Rikusen Takata, Japan, and that the boat had been lost in the tsunami. The students from Del Norte High School saw the boat, too. They were amazed that the little boat hadn't sunk. They liked the name Kamame because there were a lot of seagulls in Crescent City. No one knew what to do with the little boat. For weeks and weeks, the little boat sat alone. One day, the Del Norte High School students said, maybe we could send this boat back to the people who lost it. The students cleaned the boat. They talked to their teachers about how to send the boat home. The teachers talked to officials in America and Japan. Many people wanted to help return the little boat. Finally, Kamame was put on a ship to return to Japan. It had taken the little boat two years to travel to America. The big ship took less than a week to take Kamame back to Japan. Takata High School students came out to see the little boat when she arrived in Rikuzen Takata. It made the students smile to see their boat again. Takata High School students and teachers were very thankful that the American students had worked so hard to send their boat back. They invited the American students to visit them in Japan. The American teenagers were a little scared to go to Japan. They had never traveled so far away before. They didn't speak Japanese and wondered what it would be like to eat Japanese food and if the Japanese students would like them. They flew in an airplane across the Pacific Ocean and took a bullet train to Rikuzen Takata. They visited Takata High School and met the Japanese teenagers. The American students were happy to see Kamame in Japan. The American students learned to cook Japanese food and discovered it tasted good. They learned to sing a folk song and write their names in Japanese characters. Everyone smiled and laughed. The people in Rikusen Takata were happy to see the students having fun. When it was time for the American students to leave, they asked their new friends to visit them in Crescent City. The next year, students from Takata High School got on an airplane and flew across the Pacific Ocean to America. They visited Crescent City and the students from Del Norte High School. The Japanese students had never been to America. They studied English in school, but were a little scared about talking to the Del Norte High School students and eating American food. They wondered if the American students would like them. The Takata High School students saw the big redwood trees. They visited the spot where Kamame had washed ashore. The Japanese students and the American students laughed together. The Japanese students learned to sing an American song and write their names in English. They went to a restaurant and ate American food. Seeing the American and Japanese students laughing together made the people in Crescent City happy. What an amazing little boat! She survived the tsunami, traveled all the way across the ocean, and then came back to Japan. Everywhere Kamame went, she made people happy. The students from Takata High School and Del Norte High School made a pledge to each other. Let's be friends forever.
right here. Okay, great. Yes, this is Amy. Is Amy, stand up. Take a bow. Stand up. And as I said, this story just keeps going. Um, if the 2020 Tokyo Games do happen this summer, and there is some question now, uh, the Kemome story is going to be their featured, what I call featured fluff story. <laughs> Every time um, the Olympic Games happens, NBC has been doing this for a long time. They always have stories, background stories about the athletes, but they also select one story that illustrates connections between the United States and the host country. So it must have been six, eight months ago I got this phone call, which I actually did answer. Often I don't if I don't recognize it. <laughs> and uh, it was David Picker who is a senior producer for NBC Sports. And I said, sports? <laughs> Why are you calling me? And then he explained Olympic Games, and I thought, OK, I think I know why he's calling me. So we talked for about 40 minutes about the Camo May story. He talked to Mia. He had a list of about 10 or 11 possible stories. And the next week, he called back and said, we're going with Camo May. <laughs> so um, it'll be really interesting to see what they, I mean, the main thing they're going to be focusing on is the connections between the students and the communities. Um, so it is uh, an amazing story that has what we call legs. It goes on and on. Uh, you can't see Camel May here, but you can see a close cousin. The Tai Chu Maru is an almost identical boat that is no more than about three miles away from here, Woodley Island. The Tai Chu Maru uh, belonged to a fisherman in Miyagi Prefecture. Uh, it had had a harder life. Uh, before the tsunami, and it spent an extra year in the ocean, so it's not in quite as good a shape as Camo May is, but you could still patch it up. I mean, these little panga boats, these fiberglass panga boats are amazing. And when Amy was first working on her illustrations, uh, Troy Nicolini, who is the warning coordination meteorologist at the Weather Service, who went with me to Chile on a post-tsunami reconnaissance, uh, and is very into boats. He looked at uh, Amy's first drafts and said, you don't have that panga boat right, <laughs> and said, you need to come here. And so Amy did, and spent quite a while walking all around the Taishu Maru, who there was no interest in it being returned. It wasn't in as good a shape. Um, and in Japan, there's a really big difference between something that is public. So Camo May was a public entity. It belonged. The high school is actually part of the county or the prefecture. So it, it's not a personal belonging. This is a personal belonging. And so it really didn't have the same kind of meaning. And obviously, it didn't have the connections. Uh, but it's still really interesting to see. And so I, I encourage you to take a little field trip and put your hand. You can touch the boat. And you can also see the rope at the back that was yanked away. Um, and it's, it's really uh, quite an experience. So uh, I'm going to stop here, uh, once again saying there's a cast of thousands that have contributed time and money um, towards this project. And who knows where it's going to head next. Uh, anyone have quest questions? Yeah.
Was there any radiation associated with the boat? Well, that was one of the very first questions asked. Uh, I, we did measure, try to measure it, and there was nothing on it. And, but I, I will say that's true of 100% of the tsunami debris. And there's a really good reason for that. So everybody is you know, aware of the Fukushima uh, nuclear issues. And there was release of radioactive material into the atmosphere. But that didn't occur until more than a day after the tsunami. So all of this debris is, has been, you know, within four hours, has been swept very far offshore. So it's even stuff in Fukushima. This stuff is all, Kemome is a long way from Fukushima. Um, secondly, the radioactive particles are all water soluble. So in other words, once they hit the water, they're gone. They don't maintain any kind of you know, radioactivity. Uh, and then finally, the winds were blowing to the northwest. They were not blowing in the direction where all the debris was going. So there's been a lot of testing of debris. Not a single piece has shown they're all less radioactive than the banana you ate this morning. <laughs> and it's true. Bananas are radioactive because they, they contain potassium. And there is a radioactive isotope of potassium that you probably, I consumed a half a banana this morning. Um, it's, it's part of, there are lots of things that have uh, radioactivity, including your own bodies. Um, carbon-14, uh, radioactive isotope of carbon. And anyone who breathes, as long as you're breathing, you're breathing in carbon-14 in a small percentage. As soon as you die, no more carbon-14 gets into your body. <laughs> and that's actually a, becomes a, a clock. That's one of the ways that we can date how old things are is by measuring the percentage of carbon-14 relative to carbon-12, the non-radioactive isotope. So um, radioactivity is all around us. And in the case of Camel May, that was not an issue. Another question? Yeah. I was in Crescent City when the boat was discovered. And it was discovered by high school, Del Mar High School students. It actually wasn't discovered by the students. Who discovered it? It was the, well, there were um, three young men from the Tolawa tribe who first found it and were in the process of putting it on the back of their truck <laughs> when the sheriff's department saw them. And um, there was a short discussion. And the boat ended up on the sheriff's department truck and not with the Tolawa men. Wow. Yeah. When? I heard a story or read a story about a city along the coast in Japan where they had this big discussion in their equivalent to city council because the mayor or the equivalent of the city wanted to build this huge wall. <coughs> and if that wall was built, and because that huge wall was built, these floodgates, <clears throat> that city was spared. Not true. Absolutely not true. And so what you have to realize in Japan, essentially every coastal city has these big seawalls. Uh, there were, in the area affected, there were 600 miles worth of seawalls. And in all but one community, those seawalls were completely overtopped. In fact, I showed you a slide of the, you know, the Rikuzen Takata. Those were the demolished seawalls you were looking at. Um, this 
is another factor that really influenced the high casualty numbers in Japan because they were so convinced that the seawalls were high enough that they built right up to them. And areas which were within the tsunami inundation zone of past tsunamis. But we got the seawall, not a problem. Uh, one of the stories I often talk about is what's called the miracle of Kamaishi, uh, which involved elementary school students and junior high school students in the town of Unasamai, which is a little further north than Rikuzen Takada. And the two schools were built very close to one of these very large seawalls. And they were told that the seawalls were high enough and they should just go up to the third floor of their buildings and they'd be fine. But there was an interesting program in Iwate Prefecture in training school students to be more self-reliant. And um, tsunami tendoku is sort of the word that's like, take care of yourself. And part of it, what they were taught was get to high ground. You know, rely on yourself and get to high ground. And so this, the junior high school students and the elementary school students had practiced evacuation drills together. On the day of the earthquake and the tsunami, a number of teachers said, oh, we'll just go up to the upper floor. And the junior high school students said, no, we're going to do what we were taught to do. And they immediately started evacuating. In the elementary school, the students who were up on the third floor saw the junior high school students beginning to evacuate, so they all evacuated as well. And uh, they went, sort of, they went where they thought they were going to be safe, and then they reassessed, and they went a little further. They actually ended up three stopping points. Not a single student from either of those schools was killed. Both schools were completely overtopped by the tsunami. So that is one of the really good stories. Now, in uh, other places, there were schools that refused to allow teachers or students to evacuate. They said, you're safe here. 70 students and teachers died. Needless to say, that didn't go over very well. Um, so there was uh, the reliance on seawalls and the reliance on the mapped. I mean, the, the problem was that they really didn't think they could have an earthquake larger than about an 8.3. Now, it's funny because I'm part of the paleo tsunami community. We were here in California well aware that there's evidence of very great earthquakes from Japan. Um, particularly off of Hokkaido, and we've actually incorporated those much bigger earthquakes in our tsunami modeling hazard for the North Coast. That was before the 2011 earthquake. We were already using a magnitude 9 earthquake from the Hokkaido region as part of our tsunami database. But in Japan, they were so reliant on the fact that they had had 400 years of really good data they thought they understood their hazard. Well, when it comes to earthquakes, 400 years, it's a drop. In. Turns out, about 1,000 years ago, there was a very similar earthquake to what happened. We now know a lot more about it because there's been a lot more research done. But uh, that the seawalls were part of the problem in Japan. They're all being rebuilt, and there are a lot of people that are very unhappy about it, but it's a central government decision. And if you've ever been to Japan, you have to realize that it's a country where engineering rules, and somebody makes a lot of money on cement and concrete, <laughs> because everything is engineered. Yeah? I'd like to have to come down to the local area. If we ever had an earthquake that produced a tsunami of that magnitude, 
Yep. And it would probably, I'm assuming, overrun some over peninsula that we have out there. How far up in terms of practicality, like monuments, houses, buildings, would it come into your region? Well, the, the good news is you can even find out today where the in and where, because we've been studying this for two decades. There are a couple of things that you have to realize about earthquakes that size. We can have an earthquake the same size as what happened in Japan. We have lots of evidence. It happened 300 years ago. It happened 800 years before that. We've had at least seven or eight in the last 3,000 years that have been on the order of magnitude 9. So it's not if, but when. Um, it could be this afternoon. It could be 200 years from now. But one of the things we know a lot about the fault on which that's going to produce that. It's called the Cascadia Subduction Zone. And it runs from Cape Mendocino up to Vancouver Island, Canada. We know very precisely where that interface is and how far on land. In fact, if I drill a hole, it's eight miles beneath my feet right here. You are standing atop the largest fault system, or sitting atop, the largest fault system in the contiguous 48 states. You have to go to Alaska to find a bigger, well, you'll, you'll find it in Oregon and Washington, too. It's the same fault, because it extends all the way up to Vancouver Island, Canada. And we think that whole thing ruptures in single earthquakes. Ruptures perhaps from Cape Mendocino, certainly from the little from King Salmon, that may be the southern end of it, up to the middle of Vancouver Island. But here, most of the fault is actually beneath land. The rupture probably starts somewhere east of Willow Creek, at a depth of maybe 20 miles beneath the surface. Then it proceeds to rupture outwards, because earthquakes always start their rupture where the pressure is the highest and then ruptures to where it's shallower. And then, you know, we don't know if it starts rupturing from the north down. I think it's going to start rupturing here. Uh, rupturing here to the north. But because so much of the rupture, at least half of the rupture plane, until you get to southern Oregon, is beneath land, it's not producing a tsunami. So, all of our evidence suggests that the tsunami we're going to get will be much less than what they had in Japan and much less than what they have in Oregon and Washington. That's the good news. It might be only 20, 30 feet high, um, which is significant, but it's very different than 60, 70, 80 feet high. Um, but we have, so the good news is uh, for example, we see no tsunami deposits in Humboldt Bay until you get way down to the south end. We know the south spit's very low. Uh, Mad River Slough, perfect place to collect tsunami deposits. I've put so many holes in the slough. I've never seen a single grain of sand. Now, we know that if a tsunami were large enough to get over the Lamphere Dunes and get over the Samoa Peninsula, then you would see sand there. It would be stuck there. That convinces me that a tsunami has never been large enough to overtop those dunes. That's about 40 feet is the lowest part of the high dunes. That being said, we have two negatives. One, because the tsunami source is so close to us, it's going to arrive much more quickly than it arrived in Japan. It was close to an hour between feeling the earthquake and the largest surges in Japan. Um, in Washington state, we think it's probably closer to a half an hour before a Cascadia tsunami arrives. Here, 10 minutes is our planning number. And the final point, and I hope you will remember this, is that we're going to have a lot more ground shaking damage. I mean, that's eight miles beneath us. Off of Washington State, they're not on top of the fault plain anymore. It's all offshore. So we have to really think about the resilience of our built infrastructure. 
and think about you know, strengthening your home. We just, my son recently bought a hot house in Arcata, 1893 house, and a lot of people thought we were crazy to put in a perimeter foundation. Nope, really good idea. <laughs> you want a good foundation. So it's, they're, they're, it's complicated. Um, the new maps that are coming out in a couple of weeks uh, will, there'll be a real blitz on those media blitz and you'll get a chance to sort of see where you are relative to our current best estimate of the hazard. Yes, I had a question. Um, the hill between McKinleyville and Fieldbrook, when you get on yeah. the hill, there's a huge sand deposit up there. Would that be basically earthquake or would that be? Dunes. Dunes, dunes, dunes. What's the weather been like lately? <sighs> yeah, in fact, all of those big terraces in McKinleyville are big, thick, massive dune deposits. Even the ones on the very top of the hill. Even on the very top. In fact, they've been popping up. The, uh, our coastline is popping up. And it's those big earthquakes that actually causes the coastline to pop up. Um, I'm going to do one more question now, and then if anyone wants to hang around and grab me, I'm glad, but I think some people might want to go somewhere else. What about that great combination of sea level rise and tsunamis 50 years from now? Well, you know, I mean, the thing, the, a sea level rise, I mean, a tsunami involves the entire water column from the seafloor up to the top, and your potential to do damage is... Uh, if you increase sea level by that far, you are increasing your exposure. So uh, certainly that's an issue. When you're talking about a Cascadia tsunami, it is so large compared to the scale of the uh, sea level rise that that's kind of noise. I mean, the variation, a, a Cascadia tsunami might have places in Oregon State where it reaches 60, 70 feet, but there'll be places that'll be high and then there'll be places that are low because a tsunami is responding to the topography of the seafloor and the shape of the coast. And you actually set up a whole oscillation on the continental shelf. And if you have bays, like one of the reasons Crescent City is what we call a tsunami magnet is you get oscillations that get set up within the bay and then more successive waves come in and interact with it. The result is a very complex, you don't have a nice line. There are few places. 2004 Indonesia was very close, it was amazing. It was about 60 meters high, everywhere, like a bathtub ring, but it's the only tsunami I've ever seen that was so uniform. Um, the sea level rise has other issues, obviously, and certainly the erosive characteristics can make a lot of areas much more vulnerable. Um, so I'm not poo-pooing sea level rise uh, by any means, but it's not, when you're talking about really large, modest tsunamis, it can be significant. If you increase sea level this much, the difference between, you know, this high and this high in a harbor area, low-lying area, it can be significant. But when we're talking about the really big ones, um, it's kind of lost in the, in the noise. So thank you all. Um, it's great. And thank you to Lori for sharing her time and expertise with us. Come next week to hear... Amy's husband, Reese, talk about... A dozen wonderful spring and early summer outings Much that you can take. Much more sweetness and light. <laughs> <laughs> and we look forward to seeing you next week with Reese. And thank you ever so much, Lori and Amy, for all your work. It's wonderful to see you. Please all be safe. Wash your hands lots. Mm -hmm.